So yeah, so, uh, you know, my name's Ray Zimmerman. You can probably tell from the funny accent that I'm not from around these parts. I grew up in the East End of London. I'm originally from a Jewish family. And I first learned about the Baha'i Faith when I uh, went to college in Dallas, Texas in 1985 and fell in love with a young lady who uh, had just become a Baha'i. Never heard of the Baha'i Faith before and I wasn't really interested in religion. However, I was interested in this young lady and her name was uh, Becky Bourgeois, which I found very intriguing. And uh, I learned a lot about the Baha'i faith from Becky. And of course, we fell in love and got married. And we've been married for the 36 years. And uh, I was actually an atheist when I first heard about the Baha'i faith. And uh, if you like, after this presentation, I can share a little bit about what uh, happened that pushed me over the edge, so to speak into uh, living the life of the spirit. But in any case, just to give a quick overview of the Baha'i faith, uh, Baha'is are members of an independent worldwide religion based on holy scripture revealed by a prophet with the title Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah is an Arabic word, which means the glory of God. And Baha'u'llah lived in 19th century Iran. And actually he died in what was then Palestine, today uh, Israel. So the Baha'i community is more than 170 years old and it's grown rapidly since its beginnings in the 1840s. And now there are some estimates that say that there are 7 million believers worldwide. Other estimates say that there are more than 7 million, possibly more than 8 million as well. And the Baha'i community worldwide is very diverse. Baha'is come from every ethnic group, tribe, nation, class, and religious background. And like me, non-religious background too. But the central purpose of the Baha'i faith is to establish the unity of the human family, the human race. Now unity to the Baha'is does not mean uniformity. Instead, we believe in unity through diversity. So that means that we accept and respect differences in culture and race. And I would say really we go more than accepting and respecting, we celebrate differences in culture and race. And Baha'is around the world are seeking spiritual solutions to their own personal struggles, the problems of their communities, and actually on an international scale, global problems, all based on sacred principles. And possibly the most famous quotation from Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, is that the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. So Baha'is think of ourselves as uh, citizens of the world, global citizens, members of one human family. So what are these sacred principles that form the basis of the Baha'i faith? Well, first of all, the Baha'i faith is a religion. We believe in God. Now, Baha'u'llah is very clear that the human capacity to understand God is too limited to really fully to be able to gather much of anything really about the infinite capacities of the divine. And so Baha'u'llah tells us that God is actually an unknowable essence, unknowable in the sense that an individual human being just can't encapsulate in his or her, their own mind, the enormity of, of God. However, God does have a way of sharing spiritual truth, guidance, and wisdom with humanity. And that is through a series of messengers or prophets. And these prophets have been, co been coming to give guidance to humanity every 500 to 1,000 years. And some of the prophets that we know by name are listed on the right-hand side, Abraham, Krishna, Moses, Zoroaster, Buddha, Christ, Muhammad, and then the Bab, who is a forerunner of Baha'u'llah, kind of a John the Baptist figure, and of course, Baha'u'llah himself. And these prophets of God are the, the word of God on earth, the mouthpiece of God. They speak God's truth to humanity in a way that can be understood at a particular stage in human spiritual and civilizational development. So Baha'is actually believe that all of these 
teachers, these divine messengers, are teaching one unfolding faith, the faith of God. And because these faiths are taught at different times and different languages to people of different cultures, we have the illusion that they're actually different religions. Uh, however, from the Baha'i point of view, they're all one faith. Uh, they agree on fundamental spiritual principles. They might have some different social teachings that are specific to a historical moment or a cultural uh, atmosphere or milieu. But from a spiritual standpoint, they're all teaching the same basic truths, love one another, use the golden rule, manifest attributes and qualities that are spiritual and work for the betterment of humankind and for peace. So in this sense, the religions are all one. And Baha'u'llah has also taught something that's actually pretty obvious to all of us today, uh, that there's actually only one race, the human race. Now, historically, human beings have divided themselves up according to races. And in the ancient world, races just meant pretty much a people. So the Greeks were a race and the Romans were a race, the English were a race and the French were a race. In the 18th and 19th century, race took on a different meaning and it coincides with the advent of colonialism worldwide. And I don't think that's uh, a, a real coincidence actually, uh, because the new concept of race that grew out of the enlightenment period really was a hierarchical one, uh, which scientists of the day, who might not recognize what they believe the science today, but the scientists of the day believe that there were various races, usually about five of them, and that they were organized according to her, a hierarchy and they were distinct. They were different species uh, of, of people, of beings. Uh, Baha'u'llah says, no, that's incorrect. All human beings are members of one human family. There's only one race, the human race. So those first three bullets on this page are what Baha'is refer to as three onenesses, the oneness of God, the oneness of religion, and the oneness of humankind. And we even have a little song about that, which if I had to, if you make me, I might even sing it later on with some help from my fellow Baha'is perhaps. But there are additional sacred principles that are very central and important to the Baha'i uh, faith and, and Baha'is as a community. One of them is the equality of women and men. Uh, there's a writing that says, and I, it's quoted here on the page, that the world of humanity has two wings. One is woman and the other man. And not until both wings are equally developed can the bird fly. Baha'u'llah actually says that women and men have been and always will be equal in the sight of God. It's just humanity hasn't really caught up to the concept fully yet. We're optimistic for the future, though. Also, Baha'u'llah teaches the elimination of all forms of prejudice. Why would we prejudge someone before we even get to know them? Uh, we need to accept everybody as shining the light of God in our world. Everybody's a, a soul. Everybody's, we're all family. We're all cousins. Um, and so the upshot of this is that Baha'is believe that we're heading towards world peace, the kingdom of God on earth. And that'll come in stages. There's a lesser peace that's basically political. And then there's the real kingdom of God on earth, the greater peace, which will indicate the maturity of humankind. Uh, however, this world peace is going to have to have some institutions to uphold it. And that's where a world federation comes in. Of course, we do have a federation here in the US. Uh, the states are all united in a federation. And we imagine in the future that all the states of the world will be united in a federation. Some other principles that are important to Baha'is are the harmony of science and religion. And there's actually a Baha'i writing that says, similar to the one on women and men, um, that science and religion are two wings of a bird. There's another writing that says that uh, religion without science is mere superstition and science without religion is mere materialism. And we've actually seen the result of science without religion through a bunch of industrialized atrocities throughout the 20th century. 
that use scientific principles as a method for exterminating people. Um, so definitely science needs religion. It's not the same as religion, but the two are the two wings of the bird. Also, Bahá'u'lláh teaches that it's time for each individual human being, to the best of his, her, or their ability, to independently investigate spiritual truth. And therefore, everybody needs to be educated and everybody needs to be literate. So universal literacy and compulsory education are very important Bahá'í principles. And another principle would be that all around the world, uh, everybody should have not one, but two languages, their home language, and then also an additional language that everybody in the world speaks, a universal language in addition to their home language. We don't know what that language will ultimately be. It looks like English is a favorite at this point. Uh, lots of countries in the world are requiring uh, their citizens to learn English, China especially. Uh, fortunately, I speak English. It's the only language I speak. So uh, you never know, it could be Chinese uh, or it could be Hindi or some combination. At one time, Esperanto was thought of as a likely candidate. In any case, uh, Baha'is also believe that the economic problems that we have, such as the extremes of wealth and poverty, can be solved through spiritual solutions. And I like to think about these billionaires Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates come to mind, who basically have, have made vast fortunes are spending the rest of their lives giving the money away to help less fortunate people. That seems to be a manifestation of spirituality addressing spiritual problems. I want to mention the founding figures of the Baha'i faith, and I'll not go into too much detail on this. There's a lot of history we could go over here. But as I mentioned, there was a forerunner to Baha'u'llah known as the Bab or the Gate in English, Mirza Ali Muhammad of Shiraz. And he actually founded a religion called the Babi religion uh, in 1844. And Baha'is actually date the beginning of the Baha'i faith to the beginning of the Babi religion because the two are so closely related. And of course, announcing his station as a messenger of God or a prophet in 19th century Iran uh, was guaranteed to cause the Bab uh, to be at the very least imprisoned. And in actual fact, he was executed by firing squad as a heretic in 1850. But before he died, he uh, revealed, well, just dozens and dozens and possibly hundreds of scriptures uh, that Baha'i still have access to today that we do consider to be sacred scripture. And he also announced the coming of one that he referred to as he who shall be manifest or he who shall become manifest, meaning a universal prophet whose role was to bring about the unification of all humankind. And one of the Bab's followers uh, quietly uh, realized that he was this coming uh, prophetic figure. Baha'u'llah, the glory of God. He had been a follower of the Bab and was in prison for his faith. And while he was in a dungeon in Tehran, he uh, had a visitation from what he described as the maid of heaven, who pointed to the crown of his head and told him that he was the promised one of all ages. And of course, those who are called as prophets of God you know, some of us may feel like, well, that's a kind of a, a great honor and a privilege. Actually, it's really a life of great sacrifice and suffering. And in fact, Baha'u'llah was a prisoner for the rest of his life. Um, he waited uh, for 10 years or more to declare to his uh, companions after he'd been released from this dungeon and exiled throughout the Middle East, finally to a prison in uh, Accra the prison city of Accra in Palestine, which is today part of Haifa in Israel, uh, he waited to, uh, to declare himself as a prophet of God. He was exiled actually to Baghdad and lived there for 10 years. And he waited for 10 years to declare his mission. Um, the Howler revealed hundreds of authenticated books, verses, prayers, and letters. Those letters and prayers and books uh, are all uh, kept in the research department in Haifa, Israel on Mount Carmel. 
at the uh, one of the buildings of the Universal House of Justice, which is the current governing body of the Baha'i faith. So we have all those writings of Baha'u'llah, also the writings of the Bab. And then the son of uh, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, uh, took over leadership of the Baha'i faith when Baha'u'llah ascended in 1892. Abdul Baha basically grew up in prison alongside his father and was not a prophet of God, but Baha'u'llah did say that he's a true exemplar of the Baha'i faith. And so Baha'is look to Abdul Baha as our example. There's a song that says, look at me, follow me, do as, do as I do, Abdul Baha. And the title Abdul Baha means the servant of the glory. Uh, Baha meaning glory, Abdul meaning servant. Abdul Baha actually was freed from prison uh, in the early 20th century and actually came to the US in 1912 and gave a series of talks uh, throughout his travels in the US. He also traveled throughout Europe as well. And these talks have all been collected. Plus he also wrote uh, books and tablets and letters and prayers of his own. And Abdul Baha ascended in 1921 and the leadership of the faith uh, then turned over to his appointed successor, Shoghi Effendi Rabani, who was actually his grandson and a descendant of both Baha'u'llah and Baha. He became the head of the Baha'i faith when he was 26 years old. That was an absolutely crushing responsibility. Uh, it was an unbelievable challenge for a young person at that time to try to bring about the growth, the consolidation and growth of a relatively new faith that was being persecuted in the Middle East and was virtually unknown in Europe. However, Shoghi Effendi was able to uh, develop the properties on Mount Carmel in Haifa, which is now the world center of the Baha'i faith. And if anyone's ever been to those buildings on Mount Carmel, uh, they're just beautiful, spectacular buildings. It's a site of a pilgrimage for Baha'is actually. Many of us have been there. Uh, he translated, interpreted the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. He uh, unleashed an administrative order around the world so that there are now Baha'is everywhere in the world and we have institutions uh, in over 200 countries. And uh, he implemented a plan that was laid out by Abdul Baha called the Tablets of the Divine Plan. I wanted to show you a few pictures. You know, the Bab, the forerunner of Baha'u'llah, was executed by firing squad and some of his followers were able to uh, retrieve his remains afterwards, even though they've been uh, put out in a ditch for uh, wild dogs to consume, they were able to save his remains. Uh, and they eventually, after being hidden and secreted and moved from one location to another, ended up in the hands of uh, Shoghi Effendi, who built this, or had this shrine built uh, over the tomb of the Bab. It's called the Shrine of the Bab. It's on Mount Carmel in Haifa. It has a golden dome. It overlooks the uh, Bay of, of uh, Haifa. And the gardens are spectacular. They're kind of like the eighth wonder of the world, and as some people call them. And Baha'u'llah himself is also buried on the outskirts of Haifa in a place named Baji, where he died as a prisoner. Uh, he wasn't always a prisoner in shackles and chains and in a cell. At a certain point, Abdul Baha was able to find a house in Baji that had been deserted um, because there had been a plague. And so he was able to purchase this house. And uh, this small side house is where Baha'u'llah himself is buried. And it's uh, an incredibly holy spot. I guess you would say it's the most holy spot for the Baha'is because this is where the, the remains of the prophet of God uh, have been entombed and we go to the shrine when we're on pilgrimage and, and pray there asking for Baha'u'llah's assistance with our lives, our families, our communities, all of our affairs. So like other faiths uh, historically, there are privileges to being a member of a faith and then there are some obligations. Uh, I think this is both a privilege and an obligation and that is to be of service to humanity. I would say that if Baha'is have one goal, it's to unify humankind, but how do you do that? Really, the mechanism for that is through service. 
That's what our teachings tell us uh, and have consistently told us for over 170 years. But all of you I know are living lives of service and there's always the danger of burnout. So that's where prayer comes in. We have to continually refresh and gladden our spirits and draw our strength from the holy ones, from the, our divine source. We have to plug in to the spiritual wall socket, so to speak, in order to, uh, to be able to become a channel of the uh, divine um, power in our lives as much as we're able to. Also, Baha'is are uh, directed to fast, another common practice among all the world's faith communities. And of course, the scientists are saying that there are benefits to fasting now, but that wasn't known from a scientific standpoint until relatively recently. Baha'is are also instructed to meditate. Baha'u'llah actually did not uh, hand down a lot of rituals. For example, with prayer, you know, we have hundreds of prayers, possibly thousands actually, but we're not really told which ones to say, except for a daily obligatory prayer. So one prayer a day uh, we're required to say. However, we're given a choice between a long one, a medium one, and a short one. Uh, to be honest with you, I usually say the short one myself. The long one's very long. Uh, the medium one is also pretty long. Uh, but in any case, they're beautiful prayers, but he didn't require us to say any more prayers than just once a day. Um, and as far as meditation goes, Baha'u'llah basically just gave us the uh, privilege to choose whatever kind of meditation we would like. Personally, I think the Buddhists know a lot about meditation and I'm a big fan of uh, the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh and I find his teachings on meditation to be crystal clear and unbelievably helpful. But I can incorporate aspects of meditation from any uh, faith tradition, actually, whatever works. I also do yoga, which is a form of meditation. And that's from the Hindu faith tradition. Also, Baha'u'llah instructed us to have fellowship with people of all faiths. Now, in the past, there was this concept of the infidel, the non-believer, the one who is not faithful, and that um, these, these are people to be shunned because they're dangerous or might have a corrosive or corruptive influence. Baha'u'llah says the opposite. He says we should consort with the followers of all religions in a spirit of friendliness and fellowship. Now, obviously, if we consort with people and they don't want to talk to us, you know, we just have to wish them well and lead them to God and uh, carry on as best we can. One interesting privilege is that only the Baha'is are allowed to contribute to the Baha'i Fund. We do not accept financial contributions from anyone who is not an enrolled Baha'i. This actually helps us to avoid undue influences or the possibility of corruption, um, which you know have been problems for some communities in the past. Uh, it does create a challenge for the Baha'is so that every building that we've built, uh, every school that we've created, every project that we initiate has to be funded from funds raised by the Baha'is themselves. And we manage. Um, Shoghi Effendi developed a mechanism for ha having Baha'i elections every year. So our administrative order, we don't have any clergy. Baha'u'llah abolished the clergy and said that each one of us uh, should become educated and minister to anyone who asks for our help. We need to study the sacred writings for ourselves and investigate truth independently. And so we don't have any clergy. So what we do is we elect uh, a local administrative body called a local assembly. Each local assembly has nine members, nine adults. I'm a member of the local assembly of the Baha'is of the city of Orange, California. And there are cities and locations all around the world that have these nine member local assemblies. And we're elected every year by secret ballot. And the principle for elections is that people elect only people that they feel have spiritual capacities and maybe some material capacities that would make them useful service to the faith. Baha'i faith operates on what sociologists refer to as servant leadership. Our leaders 
are servants and their main goal is to serve their communities, whether they're by communities or local communities. So every year we elect our local spiritual assemblies as we call them. Every five years we elect a national assembly. Sorry, every year we elect our national assembly and every five years we elect the Universal House of Justice, which is the world governing body in Haifa. The members of the Universal House of Justice as individuals have absolutely no distinction compared to any other Baha'i. They have no authority as individuals whatsoever. However, when they meet as a nine person body, they are able to legislate on matters that Baha'u'llah himself did not uh, legislate upon. So for example, Baha'u'llah uh, passed down some laws about the avoidance of intoxicating drugs. Um, and that law stands. But in those days, surrogate mothering or surrogate parenting did not exist. So Baha'u'llah did not make a law about surrogate mothering. However, the House of Justice uh, is in the position to make such a law if they want to. Uh, quite often they will leave things to the discretion of the believers themselves. They're not heavy handed about making new laws. Also, Baha'u'llah left us with a mechanism for promoting unity on our local assemblies, as well as in our local communities and throughout the Baha'i world and throughout the world in general. And that's a technique called consultation where everybody works as a team to solve a problem. Each of us shows up at the table with our ideas that we share with each other in a spirit of detachment and love and acceptance. And we try to build consensus as much as possible. If we can't build absolute unanimity, we do vote. And then uh, the minority who didn't win the vote agrees to go along with the decision uh, because if it's wrong, uh, we'll find out sooner if everyone agrees to follow that solution. Uh, here's some important Baha'i ordinances that the Baha'is are supposed to follow. One is moderation in all things. You know, Baha'u'llah really uh, did not like religious fanaticism and spoke out against it and wrote against it. Uh, but other kinds of fanaticism also are destructive. And of course, anything taken, any, even something good taken to an extreme can become toxic. As I mentioned, he also uh, created a uh, a law against the intoxicating use of alcohol and narcotics. Of course, we can use alcohol and narcotics for medicinal purposes. So you go to the hospital and they uh, give you a painkiller, uh, Oxycontin, whatever it might be, because you just had a major surgery. Uh, you're supposed to take that because we are supposed to follow uh, medical direction because we believe in the harmony of science and religion. Baha'u'llah also made it clear that Baha'i should avoid gossip and backbiting. Now, I think all religions have had this concept, but Baha'u'llah really said that gossip and backbiting are poison and that harsh words are kind of like a flame of fire and that they stay with people. I can still remember harsh things that people said to me when I was a kid. It's very hard to uh, forgive and forget sometimes. Um, although, of course, we try. Forgiveness is a divine quality. We're directed to be loyal to a government, only if it's a just government. Um, but we're certainly not supposed to mount any kind of resistance to a government. And of course, the Baha'is uh, played their part in trying to save uh, Jews in Nazi Germany, for example, and were sent to the concentration camps for doing so. So, but generally speaking, if it's a just government, we uh, are supposed to be loyal. And we're also encouraged to associate with non-Baha'i organizations, such as interfaith councils, but also human rights or civil rights organizations. And those kinds of collaborations are really important in building unity and advancing civilization. However, we are directed to avoid partisan politics of any kind. So Baha'is, uh, do not register as Democrats or Republicans or Greens or Independents or Libertarians. Uh, I register as decline to state. And 
we're basically not supposed to be prejudiced. So, uh, you know, if the Republican candidate is a person of honor and has policies that seem compatible with a high point of view and seem just, I could just as well vote for a Republican as a Democrat who might also have some policies and beliefs that uh, are aligned with the Baha'i teachings. It's also uh, an ordinance, something that we should try to do, which is to share the message of Baha'u'llah. And we're actually told there are some blessings associated with this. Personally, I feel very blessed because I'm asked to give a talk of this kind where I get to share about the Baha'i faith. And uh, on the other hand, we're not supposed to proselytize. Uh, there's a Baha'i writing that says that when two people argue about religion, they're both wrong because the purpose of religion is unity. So how do we teach about the Baha'i faith without proselytizing? Well, I guess we just have to wait until somebody asks us to share and keep an eye out that they're not getting bored or starting to feel a little uncomfortable or wishing that we would make it stop. But it's truly a pleasure and it is a privilege uh, to uh, be called on to share about the Baha'i faith. And then the Baha'is also have meetings amongst ourselves every 19 days. And I'm going to talk about the Baha'i calendar in a few minutes. But basically every 19 days, the Baha'is of the city of Orange, where I live, get together. We have what's called the Baha'i feast. It's really a spiritual feast, although there's always lots of food. And uh, it has three portions. First, prayers and devotions. Second, administrative discussions and consultation. And then we have fellowship or the social portion. Right now we're doing that on Zoom and no food is involved. So it's only a spiritual feast, which could be a good thing in a way, but we're looking forward to getting back together in person. And then there are various Baha'i holy days, which we're also instructed to observe. So let's talk a little bit about the Baha'i calendar. And I wanna thank uh, Lane Calvert, by the way, for sharing a presentation that he himself has given. This was one of the slides from his presentation that uh, I think is very helpful. Baha'is follow what's called the Badi calendar. Badi is a, I think it's a Persian Arabic word and it means uh, wonderful, but it also means new. So kind of like the wonderful new calendar that the Bab actually instituted. It has 19 months and 19 days. Of course, that only adds up to 361 days so what happens to the other four days? Well, those, if you can look on the bottom right-hand corner here, are grouped as what we call the intercalary or intercalary days. And that's a festive period where Baha'is are called on to visit each other, uh, give gifts and do service. Uh, the Baha'i calendar begins on the 21st of March with the month of Baha, which you can see at the top there in red. There are 19 months each month is named after an attribute or quality of God, a quality that each of us should aspire to. And then each one of the 19 days is also named after one of these qualities as well. So 19 months and 19 days. And you can see on the right-hand side, kind of at the top, the Baha'i Holy Days. And one of those is the Baha'i New Year, also known as Nauruz, which means new day or new year. Um, that's a celebration that's celebrated in the Middle East, not only by the Baha'is, uh, but the Baha'is have adopted it, the Bab adopted it. And then some of these other uh, holidays that we celebrate are known as the festival of Rizwan. Rizwan is a word which means paradise. And these um, days are considered the holiest time of the Baha'i calendar because they represent the time when Baha'u'llah, after his 10 year sojourn or exile in Baghdad, went to a garden uh, near Baghdad and he renamed the garden the Garden of Rizwan or Paradise and announced to his followers that he was the promised one that the Bab had been promising and actually that all the religions of God had been prophesying for millennia. And so we have uh, a number of days of Rizwan that we celebrate. Of course, we celebrate the day that the Bab himself declared his station as a prophet of God, the 23rd of May. I actually declared myself as a Baha'i on the 23rd of May, uh, quite by accident. And funnily enough, Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, was born on the 23rd of May in 1844. 
So I actually share a birthday uh, with Abdul Baha and also with the Baha'i faith itself. So I don't know, that kind of makes me feel a little bit special, um, or at least it makes me feel special on the 23rd of May because all the Baha'is around the world are apparently celebrating my Baha'i birthday. Not really, it's just a holy day. I was lucky enough to declare on that day myself. Uh, we recognize and commemorate the ascension of Baha'u'llah, the death of Baha'u'llah on the 29th of May. We also commemorate the martyrdom of the Bab on the 9th of July, as well as the birth of, Baha, uh, of the Bab and the birth of Baha'u'llah in October and November. We also have what's called the Day of the Covenant. Abdul Baha was born on the 23rd of May, but he was not going to share a birthday with the Bab. And so instead, uh, we have the Day of the Covenant, which uh, recognizes, in a way, the birthday of, Ab of Abdul Baha. Um, and then, of course, the ascension of Abdul Baha is also commemorated by the Baha'is. So that's a quick overview of the Baha'i calendar. The question that often comes up when I give these kinds of presentations is what are the Baha'i teachings on the afterlife? So I thought I'd just have a slide on that. This is a quotation from Baha'u'llah himself. He says, the nature of the soul after death can never be described, nor is it meet and permissible to reveal its whole character to the eyes of men. The prophets and messengers of God have been sent down for the sole purpose of guiding mankind to the straight path of truth. The purpose underlying their revelation have been to educate all men that they may at the hour of death ascend in the utmost purity and sanctity and with absolute detachment to the throne of the Most High. The light which these souls radiate is responsible for the progress of the world and the advancement of its peoples. I think there's a lot packed into those few sentences there. First of all, human beings don't really understand the nature of the soul, and especially what happens to the soul in the next world. We do believe that the soul uh, continues after the death of the body, uh, and there are other teachings that say that the soul will be able to recognize other souls that we knew in this material realm. And also that the soul will continue to grow spiritually uh, infinitely and grow ever closer to God. And proximity to God is what Baha'is would refer to as heaven. And distance from God is what Baha'is would think of as hell. So actually, even in this material life that we're in, we can make life hell for ourselves just by getting further and further away from God, or we can enjoy heaven on earth um, by trying to live up to our spiritual teachings, whatever our faith may be, and trying to shine the light of God through our deeds in this world for the benefit of others and the benefit of civilization. Then he says that the prophets and messengers of God have basically been sent down to give us guidance and to put us on the straight path. All the religions talk about the straight path in one way or another. I actually have another talk I give about the, uh, it's called walking the mystical path with practical feet. And I have a number of uh, slides there about what all the different religions say about the path. Uh, so we all have a concept of this journey that we're undertaking, this spiritual journey and of course, the purpose of these messengers is to give us guidance along that journey to help us find our way uh, to growth and spirituality and, and uh, proximity to, to the divine. Their purpose, of course, is to educate all of us, not just so we can live good lives in this world, but also so that at the hour of death, we will be able to ascend with purity and sanctity and be able to be detached from this material realm and recognize that this world that we're living in, it's kind of like the womb of a, of a soon-to-be mother who is going to give birth, and the baby doesn't want to leave the womb. However, it needs to be born into the world outside of the womb. And so this material world is kind of like a womb world as well, and we're about to be born on our death into a spiritual world that's even more amazing than this material world that we live in uh, today. And then it talks about the light that the souls radiate once they've gone into the next spiritual realm. 
and it's responsible for the progress of the world and the advancement of its peoples. And of course, that's a mysterious concept. What does that even mean? One thing that we do know is that the souls who are in the next world are praying for us. Uh, it's also possible that they exercise a spiritual influence over us and over our decisions, possibly even over events that take place in this material world. Um, you know, Baha'u'llah basically said that if we knew exactly what goes on in the next world, all of us would commit suicide because we would rather be there than here. Because this world, as the Buddha said, is really characterized by, by suffering. Uh, the next world, not so much, especially if we develop spiritual qualities in this world. I like that last sentence because to me, it honors spiritual teachings about the role of ancestors. And there are many indigenous faiths that talk about the spiritual influence and power of ancestors and call on people to pray for their ancestors, to pray to their ancestors for help. And I think that it's, it's beautiful to me actually that the Baha'i faith not only recognizes um, religions for whom we know the names of their founders, but also many indigenous faiths and ancient faiths where the names of those founders have been lost. And yet those, speech, those teachings continue to guide uh, folks today. So those are some thoughts about the afterlife. Um, I once again want to thank Lane because he had some beautiful materials in his talk that he shared with me about the houses, the Baha'i houses of worship. And uh, you can see that they're very diverse. And it's currently what we call a mother temple on each inhabited continent. And starting in 2012, the House of Justice said that basically what we're going to do is start to have more of these mother temples or houses of worship throughout the world. Uh, they call for preparatory work to begin in the DRC in Papua New Guinea. And also some local houses of worship. Those will be the continental ones in DRC in Papua New Guinea. And also some local houses of worship in Cambodia, India, Kenya, Colombia, and Vanuatu. And uh, three of those have already been built since 2012. And I just thought I'd show you a few pictures of these beautiful houses of worship. Uh, the first one, and I put them in date order as to when they were completed. The first one was completed in 1919 in Turkmenistan. Sadly, that one was destroyed in an earthquake uh, in the 1940s. And I think it was finally just torn down completely in the 1960s and has never been rebuilt, probably for political reasons having to do with the attitude towards the Baha'is uh, in those parts of the world at this time. Um, of course, some of you may have been to the uh, Baha'i temple in uh, Wilmette, Illinois. Uh, one thing you, you may notice, or maybe it's not entirely clear from this picture, is that each of these houses of worship have nine entrances. So you can see this one here, the view shows us three of them, but imagine another three on one side, another three on the other side, and then you've got nine. And each of these entrances uh, signifies or symbolizes uh, the many paths to God or the major religions, depending on how you want to think about it. And uh, this one was finished in 1953. The foundation stone was laid by Abdul Baha when he came to America in 1912. It took a long time for the Baha'is to raise the money to build this, but it's just a gorgeous uh, building. Uh, there's a beautiful building also in Uganda, completed in 1961, also with nine entrances. And the Baha'i uh, houses of worship have their own aesthetic because of the nine entrances, but I also think that they're intended to kind of draw upon local culture and customs uh, so that they blend in with their local communities. Uh, Sydney, Australia uh, also got one in 1961 and that was completed then. Here's one in Germany, not far from Frankfurt, finished in 1964. They're all different from each other, but they're all, they kind of have a theme. Panama City, 1972, also has a lovely dome. Many of them have domes. One in Samoa was finished in 1984. This is my favorite. It's the one that was finished in 1986 in New Delhi. It's called the Lotus Temple. And you can see it's kind of in the shape of a lotus flower, also with nine entrances. And uh, 
I've always just thought that was a spectacular piece of architecture, regardless of, of which faith community uh, it comes from. It's just an amazing building and a beautiful. I've never been. I hope to go someday. Uh, relatively recently, a new one was built in uh, Chile. Also very lovely. And the one in Cambodia, as recently as 2017. A new one in, 20, in 2018 in Colombia. And most recently, 2021, there was one finished in Kenya. I think beauty is very important to the Baha'is. Beauty is, of course, one of the names of God, one of the attributes of God, and something that Baha'is and Baha'i artists should aspire to. I thought you might be interested to know that the Baha'i faith uh, has spread throughout the world since its origins in the 1840s in Iran. Uh, there's an estimated population of about 8.5 million. Uh, in 2017, The Economist, which is a British magazine, reported that there were more than 7 million Baha'is. 2016, there was a yearbook of religious demography, said that there were almost 8 million worldwide, uh, noticing that it had grown Baha'i faith had grown at an overall rate of 2.79% across the century between 1910 and 2010. Now, the countries with the largest Baha'i populations in 2015 were, starting with the largest, India, uh, which I saw a source that said 2 million. Yes, same paragraph there says 2 million Baha'is in India. The US, I think there's about a, um, 180,000 Baha'is in the US. Uh, Kenya has a very large Baha'i population. Vietnam, Congo, Philippines, Zambia, South Africa. Uh, Iran has 300,000 Baha'is. Uh, it's the largest religious minority. Uh, the Baha'i faith is the largest religious minority in Iran. And Bolivia also has a significant Baha'i population. And then that last bullet basically says that the Baha'i faith is the fastest growing religion. Uh, around, apparently. So growing very rapidly. Of course, the Baha'is are a persecuted minority in Iran, uh, especially after the 1979 Islamic Revolution. The authorities renewed efforts to eradicate the Baha'is that had gone on in the 19th century and early 20th century. Since 1978, a total of 221 Persian Baha'is have been executed, disappeared, were killed for their beliefs, thousands have been wrongly in prison, fired from their jobs, also barred from pursuing higher education. Many Baha'is have had their property confiscated or destroyed. It's basically an attempt to eradicate the Baha'i community in Iran and also to prevent them from prospering by disallowing them from going to college. So when Baha'is uh, try to enroll in college, they're given a card that asks them what their religion is Baha'i is not an option on that card. And if they don't put Muslim or Christian or Zoroastrian or Jewish, they're not allowed to enroll. So it's an effectively a way of preventing young Baha'is from entering universities and colleges. Of course, the Baha'is started their own college uh, known as the Baha'i Institute of Higher Education, but the government clamped down on that, arresting teachers and putting them in prisons. Uh, so yeah, you can see that that uh, persecution continues. So the Baha'is, I would say, are what I would call an activist faith. Uh, we've been instructed by our, the House of Justice to follow a plan, and that is to use service to bring about unity throughout the world. And specifically, they've given us these four paths of service, children's classes, teaching children about spirituality and service, uh, pre-youth or junior youth empowerment programs, also teaching uh, kids between the ages of, let's say, 10 and 14, uh, how to bring peace and unity to their local communities. That's a very vulnerable age where a lot of kids are getting involved in gangs. And uh, the Baha'is are really trying to offer those kids an alternative. And actually, in some areas, uh, gang members want their kids involved in these Baha'i activities because they would prefer that their younger siblings do not get involved in the gang. Um, we also offer spiritual education classes for adults, basically trying to encourage adults of all backgrounds to 
to develop an ethic of service and spirituality and to find meaning in their lives. And then of course we have um, devotional gatherings, which are kind of unique to whoever wants to put them on. Uh, there's no requirements or rituals about those. We each get to decide, my wife and I put on interfaith devotional gatherings for years with uh, writings from all the different world religions. Uh, there's also a program called Soul Food that's international that we've been part of. It has uh, writings not only from uh, interfaith scriptures, but also from philosophers and uh, thought leaders from different uh, faith communities. I always think it's fun to throw up a slide about some of the better known Baha'is. Some of you may have heard of these folks. Of course, Andy Grammer is a big pop star today. And, uh, you know, I'm not a huge fan of his music. But I just love him. He's just a really, really caring, loving guy. He does an enormous amount of service. He's really just a very lovable and, and beautiful person, I would say. Eva LaRue is an actress. She was on one of those CSI shows. I think everybody's heard of Dizzy Gillespie, the jazz trumpeter, who uh, became a Baha'i pretty early on. Uh, unlike many of his, uh, his peers, he did not become a heroin addict because Baha'is are not permitted to experiment with intoxicating drugs of any kind. And uh, he introduced the faith to a lot of jazz musicians. So there are many jazz musicians who are Baha'is these days. Kathy Freeman is a uh, Australian Aboriginal uh, Olympian, gold medalist for a sprint. And she uh, became a Baha'i later in life. She does identify as a Baha'i and also as an indigenous rights activist. Some of you might be familiar with uh, Justin Baldoni. Uh, he's a TV actor and has been in some films too, but he's probably most famous for that show, Jane the Virgin. I wasn't that interested in uh, soaps or telenovelas, but I had to introduce Justin Baldoni when he gave a talk at Chapman University here in the city of Orange. So I had to research him and my wife and I started watching Jane the Virgin and it was such a blast that we couldn't stop watching. It was hysterical. It's really a fabulous show and he's very good in the show, of course, but I just thought the show was just incredibly well done. It's basically a parody of soap operas and it has a great ethos to it, a great spirit. But Justin Baldoni is also just a tremendous philanthropist. And uh, I think he's walking the talk. Tierney Sutton may be less familiar, although she's been nominated for Grammys, I don't know, a dozen times. And I think she actually won a Grammy um, for that film that Clint Eastwood did about the pilot. I can't remember what that film was called, but she and Clint Eastwood and another Baha'i, J.B. Eccle, actually wrote a Grammy winning song uh, for that movie. And of course, she's a very uh, remarkable jazz singer. Uh, and she's recorded some Baha'i prayers uh, and hidden words, some of the Baha'i scriptures, as well as jazz standards. I think probably Rain Wilson may have been the most famous Baha'i of our time, the longest, because he was on that show, The Office, and he's been in Star Trek. Uh, he also is a great philanthropist and uh, a very generous and giving and sacrificial person. And then kind of an oldie but goodie, uh, Carol Lombard. I was a little surprised. My dad was a Carol Lombard fan uh, back when I was a kid in the 1960s. And uh, of course, she uh, was a star way before I was a kid, but my dad was very nostalgic. So we watched her movies. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to try to wrap it up pretty soon. Um, in fact, I think I'm actually about ready to wrap it up, I wanted to show you this video that I think kind of captures the spirit of the Baha'i faith in a very beautiful way, both in terms of the emphasis on the arts, on beauty, on music, and also on uh, diversity. And so this is a, uh, a Baha'i verse that's been put to music by a guy named Ali Yusefi, who's a Baha'i musician. And he basically assembled a choir uh, from all around the world. I think he has like maybe a hundred people from around the world who are singing on this video. It's called One Tree. So I just want to make sure, I'm going to just stop sharing for one second to make sure I check the boxes to show this video correctly. So, yes, I did. So here we go. I'm going to share this video. It's about five minutes long and I hope you guys enjoy it.
somebody's telling me in the chat that Sully was the name of that movie. Thank you for that. All right. I'm afraid I did something wrong here. So give me one more chance to share this again. Okay, that's better.
That was lovely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for giving me a chance to share. Thank you so much. Uh, so are there any questions? Go, go ahead, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, put your question out there. I will check the chat if anyone drops a question there, but uh, feel free to unmute. There. A little bit more light. Yeah, go ahead, Cheryl. Okay, I got a whole mess of questions. <laughs> so I don't know if we want to cover all of them or give somebody else a chance, but okay. Um, along the way, you said you prayed to Baha'u'llah. Um, do you, is that God to you? Or is he a prophet and you prayed to the prophet through to God? Or how, how does that work? Or So Baha'is believe that the station of the prophet is, is twofold. On the one hand, the prophet is a human being. And on the other hand, the prophet is kind of overwhelmed by the revelation of God speaking through him or her. So when Baha'u'llah was revealing divine teachings, he was God. I see. If we were to say he was God, that would be correct. At the same time, when he was having dinner with his family or playing with his grandchildren, at that time you could say, well, he was not God. So when we pray to Baha'u'llah, we pray to him in his divine station. We're praying to God through Baha'u'llah because mm -hmm. God is the unknowable essence. So we, it's kind of like, if I can say this, if I pray to Jesus, Jesus is God. So Jesus is going to answer my prayers. The Baha'is believe also that uh, we can pray to any of the prophets. Okay. Allah, the Buddha, Krishna, Zoroaster. Okay. All speaking with the voice of God and offering us a chance to commune with the divine. That's great. Thank you. Um, how do you practice fasting? What does it look like for you? So I'm sure you're familiar with um, Ramadan in <laughs> Islam, where the Muslims will fast between sunrise and sunset for 30 for days. Month. Yeah. For a month, yeah, for uh, one of the months. Um, I always say that uh, Baha'u'llah gave us a discount because <laughs> we only have to fast for 19 days. However, we do fast between sunrise and sunset, no food or water or drinks of any kind. Of course, if somebody is sick or elderly or pregnant, uh, they actually should not fast. So only those who are able to are supposed to fast. And like the fast in other faith traditions, it really is not so much about the food. It's really a time of introspection, of spiritual purification, of developing empathy for the hungry and the poor yeah. in our midst and around the world. Fasting is, is a very rich experience, as mm -hmm. I'm sure you know, if you yourself have fasted. Yes. It's a very, it's very powerful humbling. time of year. Humbling. Humility is a, a godly attribute. <laughs> yeah. Um, when when uh, I was just going to add, I was just going to say that, I mean, when we fast in our church, uh, Fasting is always associated with prayer and pondering. So it's just like like you were saying, right? That I mean, we we sort of bring those things into it, and it makes it a more powerful, compelling experience. You know, dr dr draws us closer to, to God. That, that that's sort of our goal. So, thanks. Thank you. Um, so I forget his name, but when um, Ab Abdul Baha, his grandson passed on, did he pick a successor like his grandfather did? So Abdul Baha was the son of Baha'u'llah, the prophet. And when he okay. passed on in 1921, he picked his grandson, Shoghi Effendi, to be his successor. When Shoghi Effendi passed on in 1921, uh, he did not pick a successor. Okay. And so at that time, the Baha'i world was kind of realized that it was time for some a new stage in the evolution of the faith and that's when we began to elect or shortly after then we began to elect 
the institution of the Universal House of Justice, um, which is the supreme guiding body of the Baha'i Faith in Haifa, Israel. And so Shoghi Effendi was known as the guardian of the Baha'i Faith. We, we no longer have a guardian of the Baha'i Faith. What we have instead is the House of Justice. Okay. Um, I would say, by the way, that the writings of Shoghi Effendi kind of constitute a guardian. Uh, yeah, so Sue, Sue is reminding me that Shoghi Effendi passed in 1957. But I would say that we still have the Guardian because we still have the writings of Shoghi Effendi. Um, so how do you go about joining the Baha'i Faith? Is there a, like a baptism or an, an, some sort of initiation practice? Well, as I mentioned, the Baha'is are very um, short on rituals. We have virtually no rituals whatsoever which gives us a lot of, or I should say, no prescribed ritual. So we have a lot of freedom uh, in how we want to practice the faith in many respects. And one of them is how somebody wants to become a Baha'i. Um, the rock bottom basic is that they fill out a form that says, I would like to become a Baha'i. And then that gets submitted uh, to their national, to the, usually to their local assembly and then to the national assembly of whichever country they're in. Uh, some people like to have a little gathering when they're declaring. Uh, youth at the age of 15 uh, are enrolled as Baha'is and may have a little party to celebrate that. But um, it's really up to the individual if they want to do anything special. But basically, it's a matter of declaring one's faith in Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, and being willing to abide by the laws and ordinances of the faith. Well, and also I heard there's a, so there's a record, essentially, right? for everyone that's a member. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, so one of, you, one of the tenets you shared is uh, sharing the messages of Baha'u'llah. Um, do you also, is it part of the tenets to share the other holy leaders or prophets? Yes, I mean, we're sharing our faith which includes the writings of Abdu'l Baha, Habab. Okay. Um, so we're sharing the teachings of the faith. We share the scriptures of the faith if people would like to investigate them for themselves. So um, yeah, really we're just trying to share what we have. Okay. In our children's classes, we actually teach them about all the, the prophets of all the different faiths. Oh, and they okay. learn about how all faiths uh, see God. So okay. the children start with it. Very nice. What is the significance of 19 days? Now, I'm going to call on my good and dear friend, Tony Lee here to help me with this because I'm an English major and the numbers have always been a little bit challenging to me. It's a sacred <laughs> number. It does have a significance. Uh, the number nine also is a sacred number, but I know that Tony, who's a Baha'i historian, our excellence, is going to be able to um, explain the significance of these numbers for us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's so good to see you, Ray. I haven't seen you in such a long time. <laughs> when this is all over, we'll get together. But. Uh, yes, uh, these numbers are symbolic. I mean, they don't have any magical significance. Uh, they're often based on Arabic words and their numerical values, so that the number 19 corresponds to the word Bahed, which means unity. And since uh, the Baha'i faith is so focused on unity, it becomes an important uh, number. The number nine is also important to Baha'is. These Baha'i temples have nine entrances. And that's, a, <laughs> that's another symbol of unity since nine is the highest single digit and all the other uh, numbers are incorporated in it. But it doesn't split yet into a 10. <laughs> um, it's, it's still one. So, uh, you know, these numbers are symbolic and we can play with them, but, uh, you know, they're only symbols. Okay. Am Are you I glad last... I asked him to explain that? Yes, that was great. 
Um, and my last question is, do you have a belief about what happened before we are born? You know, I have to say, I'm going to ask for a little help from some of my yeah. fellow believers on this well, one also, yes. because it's kind of mysterious to me. Yes, uh, certainly. But, you know, these are states of being that really cannot be explained in words. Uh, uh, before you are born, there is a potential for human perfection, which is realized, uh, well, not only at the moment of conception, but throughout your life as you continue to realize that potential. But I have to hear uh, cite a verse from the Quran because it's so beautiful. And uh, in the Quran, uh, there is a, again, metaphorical story uh, about before creation, God calls before him every soul that will ever be born on earth. And he says to all of these souls before creation now, um, and he says to them, am I not your Lord? And every human soul answers, thou art. So that before creation, every soul has acknowledged his creator and has become a believer. And that potential then is uh, realized with the conception and birth of every human being. So that it's a very, um, beautiful story about the unity of humanity even before you know the creation of the world very nice thank you so much i appreciate it thanks cheryl for those great questions um hey i wanted to ask a question that sort of jumps off of that Did, is there any what, what what's the baha'i view or concept of good and and versus evil uh good choices versus bad choices is there any is there any concept of the devil or satan or you know some some force that um that influences of uh, folks to make bad choices so i'll take a shot at this and please others feel free to chime in and uh, add to anything i might say but you know the baha'i faith is largely focused on good because our goal is to manifest divine virtues. We're told that we're all made in the image of God. What does that mean? Well, it can't be true physically because we all look different. But from a spiritual standpoint, we're all made in the image of God. And the analogy that's used in the Baha'i writings is that the soul is like a mirror reflecting the sun. God is the sun and the rays of the sun are reflected off of the mirror and each of us can reflect the light of God. And the qualities of God, the light of God, are God's attributes or virtues. Love, mercy, justice, beauty, creativity. There are dozens of these attributes or qualities of God. And so each one of us can reflect those qualities. And that's what we're aspiring to do <clears throat> in this world to prepare ourselves for the next world. It, it also says in the Baha'i writings that there's no such thing as evil as a force in itself. Evil is just simply the absence of good. So when we don't aspire to manifest divine light through our deeds, we might fall short. We might have some shortcomings. And usually the reason for this is because of what the Baha'i writings refer to as the insistent self. And I think all the religions talk about this concept of the insistent self. Sometimes people talk about the ego and of course, vices are associated with that self, but the vices are essentially just failures to live up to our, our, our latent divine qualities that we ought to be manifesting. Um, another analogy that's used is that uh, if uh, goodness is the light, then evil is just merely the absence of light. But the Baha'i writings don't talk a lot about the devil or Satan when Abdul Baha does refer to Satan or the devil, he actually defines it as the insistent self. 
And I personally think that that's a very elegant definition and it explains a lot about human behavior, uh, at least from my point of view. We, we have this um, uh, scripture that says the natural man is an enemy to God. And it's, it, it's interesting to think about it in that sense of, of what you, I think also you mentioned earlier how, you know, sort of as people draw closer to God, you know, they're, they're more like in heaven, right? And farther away, more like in hell. So, and, but that notion for our religion of the natural man is, I think, very consistent with that idea of the insistent sort of selfish, um, you know, um, sort of oriented around the, the, you know, what's good for me at the expense of everyone else. And probably most bad choices could be tied to that type of, um, maybe perspective or, or even attitude, maybe so. Okay, thanks, thanks for that, that's, that's very helpful. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you, James. And, and you just, you reminded me to add something here, which is the, sure. the Baha'i writings also see, just as we see the prophet as having kind of a dual nature, uh, human beings also have a dual nature. We have a spiritual nature, which is the nature of our soul. And we also have what the Baha'i writings call an animal nature. And so I think everybody knows what that animal nature feels like when we start having cravings for things that are not good for us, or we can't stop indulging in something that the body is craving and enjoying. You know, I think this could be uh, thought of as a source of addiction where the animal takes over. Abdul Baha says that if we allow our soul to become completely numbed and stupefied, <clears throat> that we're no better than the cow in the field chewing the cud. And so obviously our goal is to aspire beyond our animal material nature and aspire instead to a spiritual nature, uh, which involves acquiring virtues. Yeah, I, I, that's very consistent with that doctrine idea that we have with the natural man. I think that I think I probably don't quote it right, but the next verse says, and to, it, to paraphrase, how does one become uh, not a natural man, man and woman, of course, it, it's referring to that is to yield to the enticings of the spirit. So it's this idea that to, to yield or to give into this, this force this, that, that's, that, that's actually trying to pull us to do good, right? Enticing us, trying to lead us um, to make good choices. We have to sort of like push against that, actually make, make an effort to, uh, you know, to, to, to push away from God because Nat, th there's a natural pull. He's, He's trying to, you know, get us to come closer to him. So uh, it's, it's, it's nice to understand that concept in, in the words that you guys will use in your faith. So, so thank you. Um, any other questions? I have one. Go ahead, Ronald. Hi, I'm, I'm Ron. Um, we have a um, peace and justice committee in our South Coast Interfaith Council. And we've been dealing, trying to figure out how we might deal with uh, racism. We had recently a, a member of our committee spoke up of having one of the elders in her congregation sending out a letter to the whole congregation that was really racist. And mm -hmm. she was asking all of us how we might deal with that. And we encouraged her to deal with it and uh, to uh, speak with that individual and then to take it to the congregation and they've decided that they're going to study it uh, and they've come up with some materials to do that. So you, you mentioned that seeking spiritual and personal solutions uh, to social and global problems. So how, how is your faith group um, dealing with the subject of racism as it's come up? Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'm going to briefly mention that from a historical standpoint, the Baha'i faith has always been anti-racist. And in fact, when Abdul Baha arrived in the U.S. in 1912, uh, he would not allow segregated meetings and actually married one of the early black believers to one of the early white believers. Uh, and so Baha'is actually celebrate intermarriage um, as a manifestation of the unity that is our central goal. Now, race in America is a very complicated issue. It has a dreadful and terrible history. 
actually it has a kind of a double history. It has a history of racial atrocity on the one hand. And then there's also another history of race unity efforts. And both of those histories have been going along side by side. The history of racial atrocity, however, has been dominant. However, there have always been efforts to create race unity by organizations. Um, and even you could imagine that the civil war in this country was an effort to address the issue of racism, certainly the issue of slavery um, to, a, to a limited degree. Now the Baha'i faith has a, as its center, the concept of unity, but we're like everybody else. You know, Baha'is come into the faith carrying the beliefs and ideology with them that they were raised with. I once heard one of the black Baha'is say that racism is like the smog in the air in Los Angeles. Everybody breathes it in, everybody. You can't help but breathe it in. So as individual Baha'is, we have to make it a priority to eliminate our own prejudices. And probably the best mechanism for doing that is fellowship with people who are not like ourselves. So behind meetings, as much as possible, strive to be integrated and diverse and try to find ways of bringing people of different ethnic backgrounds together in service. There's actually research in the field of psychology that shows that if you wanna create bonds of unity between people from different backgrounds, the way to do it is to have them serve together. So service again becomes a kind of a central aspect. Another issue is the issue of education. People try to address the problem of racism in this country without actually educating themselves about it. And so what they end up doing is producing platitudes. And these platitudes can be actually offensive and harmful. So it behooves all of us to learn about the history of racism in this country. And of course the history of racism in this country affects not only black folks, but people of all ethnic backgrounds, especially Native Americans, and also immigrants to this country from various continents. However, this country has a special history of anti-Indigenous violence and anti-Black racism. And so we need to educate ourselves about these histories and be aware and sensitive to the fact that people that we're encountering come to us with richly diverse experiences that could involve a great deal of trauma on the one hand, or maybe not. You know, I've met folks who, uh, black folks in particular, who are very concerned about the history of racism in this country and feel personally injured by it. I've met other black folks who basically just somehow brush it off and just say, you know what, I'm moving on. I'm an artist, it's not affecting me. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm speaking from experience there. I'm not too overgeneralized. In any case, wherever we run into these problems of racism, racism is a spiritual problem. It's a fundamental failure of our ability to understand that every single human being is related to us and is a child of God. So the solution has to be a spiritual solution, but it can't just simply be this idea of saying, well, you're a child of God, I love you, we're done here. So I think I'm gonna pause there or at least maybe stop because I feel like I said enough, but I think that your community took valid action in trying to educate yourselves and then lovingly call attention to the person who wrote this letter and create an environment where people feel safe to explore their own biases because we all have them. Um, a couple of observations and a couple of questions, if I could. Uh, first of all, Dr. Zimmerman, thank you very much. This was a very informative uh, session this evening. Every other year, I co-teach a course from Loyola Marymount University where we take students to the Holy Land. And whenever we're in Haifa, we stop and, and watch the, and look at those beautiful gardens you described and showed us a photo of. Now you've given me a lot more material that I can share with the students when we're there. But uh, a couple of questions. You, you referred a couple of times to the ascension of the Bab and the ascension of Baha'u'llah. Um, are you referring to, that, to their deaths or to their physical ascension, such as the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven or Jesus ascends to heaven? Yeah, we, we use the term ascension as a term of respect rather than just saying the death, but it's the ascension of, of the sacred soul of right. Baha'u'llah or the Bab or Abdu'l-Baha. 
Good. And I, I think that you refer to both of those uh, individuals as prophets and founders of the faith. Is, is that a fair statement? Yeah, so every religion has its own jargon. Right. And one of the pieces of Baha'i jargon, which somehow I managed to avoid so far, is the concept of the manifestation of God. So Baha'is refer to prophets as manifestations of God on earth. And so we believe that the time of the Bab and Baha'u'llah was a kind of a possibly unique time because there were twin manifestations, two prophets of God walking the earth at the same time, each revealing God's word um, in the same location, actually. They never met personally, but they knew of each other. Um, and the Bab knew that Baha'u'llah was the uh, foretold prophet. I'm assuming you also saw the movie, The Bob or The Gates. Um, at one time, I know I saw that at the Parliament of the World's Religion. Would you say that was an accurate description of, of, of him and of what, of his, what he was saying? I have to say, I've seen the movie, but it was a couple of years ago. It seemed fine to me at the time. I didn't have any objections to it. Um, I thought that it was quite, it was a documentary, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah, I thought it was, it was respectful and, and authoritative. From an outsider, I thought the same. I thought it was a very, it seemed to present um, in a very respectful way. Often films don't present religious figures in respectful ways, but I thought this one did. And then a, a final question or observation, actually. When you were quoting from uh, Bahá'u'lláh's writings about the afterlife, you mentioned that one of the, the, the if I heard you correctly, one of the tenets of your belief is that the, the soul continues to grow in union with God, getting closer to God throughout what we would term eternity. Uh, that resonates so beautifully with Eastern Catholicism and the whole, whole concept of theosis, that a person just doesn't get to heaven um, and does whatever they do in heaven, but rather continues this growth in union with God. So we would resonate 100% with you right there. Thank you again for your presentation this evening. Thank you, Father Alexi. I love your comments. How does the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we believe in inter eternal progression as well? Yes. One thing that I find interesting concerning the Baha'i teachings on the afterlife is that it's not separate or distinct from this material realm it's actually superimposed upon it. So those who have gone on to the next realm are not someplace else, but they're here with us now, mm. conscious of us, praying for us, finding ways of being of service to us, and that we can call on them for assistance. And I think that's kind of an amazing concept. I have to say, you know, when I was a kid going to my Hebrew classes, Long, long time ago, as a little Jewish kid, getting ready to be bar mitzvah, um, I really thought of heaven and hell as these as actual locations or places, mm -hmm. and maybe that is how they teach little kids. But this concept of a spiritual realm that's kind of with us that we're connected to uh, in very intimate ways, I find very meaningful and uplifting. Thanks very much, Father Alexi. Any any other questions from folks? I I have a uh, one. Qu yeah. Ron, did you have a question? Go ahead, or somebody. Just another observation: the Baha'is, um, since uh, interfaith got started in the '70s, have always taken a role in interfaith and has been very active with the interface of their community. I happen to be the president of the Newport Mesa Irvine Interfaith Council. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of Baha'is that are not only presidents or past presidents, but active members of their board. So if you, you've got a Baha'i in your area, put them to work. As Ray <laughs> said, we're here for service, working with all the different faiths for the needs of the community. Here in Los Angeles, we have the uh, Interreligious Council of Southern California and Randy Dobbs, a very prominent member of the Baha'i Faith was president for served two terms as president. 
Can I make a, a quick comment concerning interfaith councils? I don't know if you guys feel the same way as I do about this, but I feel that interfaith councils are practically a miracle. When you look at the history of the interactions among religions, we're in a kind of a unique historical moment that maybe has only been going on for possibly 100 years or so, maybe 150 years um, since the first parliament of the world's religions, where people of different faiths are making a strenuous effort to consistently do fellowship with each other, to share about their teachings with each other, to get to know each other. Kind of like that speech I made at the beginning of my presentation. I personally think it's an amazing and remarkable moment. And not only that, but the writings of all the world's religions are now available for free online on the internet in a way that never happened before. So, you know, as a Jewish kid growing up in the East End of London, I suppose I could have put my hands on a Quran uh, or, you know, the Avest Zoroastrians or Gita of the Hindus, but I've kind of We lost you, Ray. <laughs> You're frozen. Am I back? You're back. You're back. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I was saying on my iPad that I have the holy books of all the world's religions uh, in my iBooks folder. And so I can read from the sacred writings of all the world's religions, um, touch of a finger. In kind of to all of you that we're in this moment right now, it seems like a kind of a, a next step somehow in the evolution of the spiritual condition of humanity. We, we lost you again, Ray. <laughs> My internet connection is a little <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I had one, one if no one else has other questions, I have one last question. I, I really would like for you to share um, uh, what, what was the work that you did that led to the award from the NAACP? You, you did mention service and education and you're an educator and uh and so and you talked about you know um that one initiative I, I think you had one of your charts talked about working with you know kids and gangs and and st or at least vulnerable to to to, to that uh influence and, and things like that through education and service and things so i i don't know if any of that's related but i but i think it would it would really be great for everyone to hear sort of what, what was the work that you did that sort of led to that recognition? Well, I'm hoping my internet connection is stable enough to answer that question. So just <laughs> let me know if there's a problem, I'll do my best. So in the 1990s, the National Assembly of the Baha'is of the US issued a statement on race unity. And around the time actually that I became a Baha'i and my wife, who was a white girl from the South, from Dallas, Texas, read that statement and said, you know what? We have to do something. We don't know any black people. We're not involved in the black community. We need to do something differently. And so she started attending meetings for the Black History Parade in Orange County. And that helped her to become friends with various members of different black organizations. Orange County does have a black population. It's very small, but very activist, very active. So my wife was the first one who got involved with black organizations. And at a certain point, we both joined the NAACP, which as you know, is the oldest uh, civil rights movement in the United States. And it's an interracial uh, civil rights movement. I should say it's the oldest interracial civil rights movement in the history of the US. Uh, it was founded by an interracial committee in 1909, if I'm not mistaken. So we became members of the NAACP and the chair of the education committee for our local branch basically just said to me, I need your help. We want to start a Saturday tutoring academy, a Saturday school for kids in the Santa Ana and Orange County area at UC Irvine. And she asked me to secure some rooms and secure some tutors, secure some funds and whatever would be needed to teach math, English and black history. And also Spanish uh, was one of the topics, one of the subjects that they wanted to teach. And so for a number of years, I was one of the um, 
officers of the uh, USA, the Unity Saturday Academy at UC mm -hmm. Irvine. And we were able to attract kids that ordinarily would never set foot on a college campus. And I think that's very important work because there are kids growing up in neighborhoods where their neighborhood is all they know. Some kids have never been outside of Santa Ana. And to bring them to a college campus and show them around and have them sit in a college classroom to be given instruction by college level educators and given background. Actually, we did black and Latino history at the school. So because I was a founding member and a kind of a, I guess a, a liaison with the university, um, that's the main reason why they gave me recognition for my work as an educator. Of course, I do other work as an educator that I think also very much deals with the topic of race unity, multicultural education. I do work on uh, the history of colonialism in my uh, honors classes at Saddleback College and uh, have taught classes on the history of the concept of race. So uh, it's obviously a topic that's very important to me as a Baha'i and as a white Baha'i, I especially feel like it's incumbent on me to be educated on these topics. Um, the other thing that we did, I think that kind of tipped the scale a little bit for that, because uh, my wife also was given an award uh, by the NAACP, was we started having these uh, fellowship banquets uh, for the black community in Orange County where we would invite members of black organizations to basically come to a banquet, which we would put on for them and offer them service. And, you know, black folks, I don't think are so used to having a group of white people saying, we would like to serve you. Hmm. We want to be the servants of the black community. It doesn't happen that much. And I remember one of the ladies, uh, Mrs. May Usury, who worked with me on the Saturday Academy, would go to those banquets. And she lived in Orange County for a long time. And she said, these gatherings are the most integrated meetings I have ever seen in Orange County. So I think there's a power to service and a power to fellowship, a spiritual power. It's a healing power. And I think white people have a lot of healing power if we're willing to show up and stop telling everybody else what to do and be of service. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And I, and I, I love how, you know, you, it really came from a desire to serve and to show love. I mean, I think that's, that, that's really what's probably needed in so many communities is a willingness to serve and a willingness to show love uh, to, to others, uh, you know, regar regardless of who they are. Right. Because, because uh, what does it say? I think there's a, a saying that, you love those that you serve or, or the more that you serve the, the, when you serve those, then you begin to love them. And yeah, there's a, there's a lot to be said to that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I've got yeah question. go ahead. Go ahead, Ron. Thanks. I see we have a Daniel here. Are you, are you, our, are you our colleague on the board of the SCIC? Uh, yes. Yes. I, uh, I was actually, uh, because I was occupied with other things. I, unfortunately, I had to resign. So last week I resigned from the board. Yeah, I was a member of the board. So we, we, need, we need to find a replacement if that's possible well, to find somebody we, to replace we, we have a replacement, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> that's me, I'm the replacement. That's Tony. <laughs> that's Tony. Well, yeah. welcome, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. I haven't done anything yet, but here I am. I should, I should say that uh, Daniel, even b way before he was a member of the uh, of SCIC board, has always been a very faithful regular to Religion 101. So uh, I've probably, gosh, Daniel, I've probably known you for like a good year and a half or so since I've been on the board because uh because daniel's at every religion 101 and uh it's always wonderful to have him and for some also elaine i don't know where elaine is uh tonight but elaine usually attends also so anyway elaine left for Mech in texas she went to texas okay. last week yeah, yeah okay yeah, well you'll have to have her dial in okay because uh <laughs> she can dial in from texas to different time zone maybe but 
And I know, and I, and I guarantee everyone, I can, I can attest for Daniel that he'll, he'll be at next month's religion 101 as well. And uh, many of those after. So, so um, unless he's on vacation, which is okay, but, but it's great to have <laughs> Daniel with us. So yeah, hopefully we can so, some face to face in person yeah. because I love human interaction than the zoom. So hopefully yeah, that's we're, we're probably going to so have some for sure. Yeah, thanks. All right. Well, look, everyone, thanks very much. Uh, really appreciate everyone's participation. Ray, I'm going to uh, give you an opportunity. I don't think we had an opportunity at the beginning for you to uh, maybe you could provide like a benediction or, or something. Is there some type of way that you would express um, uh, your faith through prayer or, or, or something like that? I, I want to give you a final opportunity to, to share that if, if you'd like. Thank you so much. I would be happy to do that. And what I will do is I will say a Baha'i prayer. And it's a prayer by Abdul Baha for humanity. And I think it captures a lot of what we've been talking about tonight. O oh, thou kind Lord, thou hast created all humanity from the same stock. Thou hast decreed that all shall belong to the same household. In thy holy presence, they are all thy servants and all mankind are sheltered beneath thy tabernacle. All have gathered together at thy, thy table of bounty all are illumined through the light of thy providence. O oh God, thou art kind to all, thou hast provided for all, dost shelter all, conferrest life upon all. Thou hast endowed each and all with talents and faculties and all are submerged in the ocean of thy mercy. O thou kind Lord, unite all. Let the religions agree and make the nations one so that they may see each other as one family and the whole earth as one home. May they all live together in perfect harmony. O God, raise aloft the banner of the oneness of mankind. O God, establish the most great peace. Cement thou, O God, the hearts together. O thou, kind Father God, gladden our hearts through the fragrance of thy love Brighten our eyes through the light of thy guidance. Delight our ears with the melody of thy word. And shelter us all in the stronghold of thy providence. Thou art the mighty and powerful. Thou art the forgiving. Thou art the one who overlooketh the shortcomings of all mankind. All right. Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. Thanks, everyone, for Thank your you participation. Have a great evening, everyone. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. We'll that was see wonderful. you next month. Yeah, very Thank wonderful. you, everyone. Thanks. Keep up the we'll good work, everybody. Beautiful we'll interface work. We'll see you all soon. Hi, Father Thank Alexi. You. I haven't seen you in a while either. <laughs> beautiful presentation, Ray. Right? Fabulous Thanks questions. Everyone. Everybody who asked the questions were fabulous questions. Wonderful questions. Thank we'll you. see Thank everyone you. next Thank month, okay? Keep, your email, right. keep, keep watching your emails, all right? Thanks all right. very much. <laughs> Have a great Thank evening. You. Bye too. now. Bye-bye.